So chest injuries in general are described as either open or closed. What do you guys think defines something as open or closed in general when we're talking medical terminology? Exposed to the outside world. It's not necessarily that a bone is broken or anything like that. It's whether it's exposed to the outside world. So open to the outside world or closed, okay? So it's basically is, is the skin punctured, right? Uh, what are some causes of chest injuries that are going to be open chest injuries, do you think? Laceration. Laceration potentially, yeah. Gunshot. Gunshot, stabbing wounds, penetrating injuries for the most part. Yeah, things like that. Um, what's our big concern with an open chest injury? Probably air. Air accumulation where it shouldn't be, right? So closed chest injuries will cause pulmonary and cardiac contusions, so bruising of the lungs and bruising of the heart itself. What does the term hemoptysis mean? Coughing up blood. Coughing up blood. So you, a lot of internal chest injuries will cause coughing up blood, so hemoptysis. So look for things like that with the, when you're talking about that mechanism of injury in a trauma situation, so a car accident, they take a blow to the chest of any kind. <coughs> We're going to look for those signs and symptoms, that pain in general, bruising, deformities, discoloration over the chest, hemoptysis in general. Those are what we're going to look for with closed chest injuries. Um, it's really important and a lot of people, especially that are newer, they don't want to expose their patients. And I can understand why, right? It might seem weird that they are complaining of this pain where a seatbelt came across their chest and you might not, like they're talking to you in full sentences. But it's important to actually expose that injury and get eyes on it because I've been burned a few times where you, you're like, oh, they're fine, they're talking in full sentences, whatever, and then you get to the hospital and like, yeah, they have like four broken ribs and have a pneumothorax or something like that, right? So always get eyes on an injury, no matter what, as minor as it may seem, remove that shoe if they're complaining of an ankle and foot pain. Take a look at that injury because you want to make sure that you're exposing patients and actually visualizing that injury as well as palpating it and assessing it. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so like a real life scenario, somebody hurt their foot and one of the like um, just trainers came over and said not to take the shoe off or anything because of whatever stabilizing and pressure and all that. Um, but we didn't know what it was because the shoe was on. So, so I can see why I they... I take it off because I wanted to see what happened. Right. But it's going to get taken off at the hospital anyways. Yeah. And we're kind of in the situation where we're getting them to the hospital. In a, I'd say like a layperson situation, a situation where they're like at a school or something like that, they're not going to want to cause any further injury at all. So they're not going to want to take the shoe off. Um, essentially what we would do is probably cut the shoelaces. Don't cut the shoe if you can't, if, you're, if you can. Take the shoe off, assess it, visualize it, wrap it with some like an ice pack over the top. Uh, so, but we do need to assess injuries, right? Uh, another thing I see with a lot of like newer people is if they have an injury or they're complaining of something is they'll assess everything but that injury, right? And like, so why didn't we assess their elbow? They're complaining of elbow pain. Like, well, I didn't want to hurt them anymore. Well, you can still assess people without causing further injury. So when people are complaining of an injury, as much as it might suck, we still have to assess that injury. It doesn't mean, okay, try to straighten, straighten your arm out and wiggle it around if you're complaining of elbow pain, but at least palpating above that injury, making sure we're not missing like a humeral fracture, palpate the bones below that elbow, palpate the elbow itself to see if it's out of place. Um, so, and then assessing CMS, like we've talked about with the uh, joint and long bone immobilization, it's kind of the similar assessment, assessing that distal circulation, or in the case of you know, chest and abdominal injuries, we're gonna do a, th a thorough assessment on top of visualizing that actual injury. It doesn't mean, okay, I should have been a little bit more specific. It doesn't mean everybody complaining of like chest pain, I'm gonna be like, oh, sorry, hold on, and cut their clothes off. It's literally like, okay, let's just take a quick look and like unbutton a couple buttons or something like that. It's within reason, right? We're not gonna just be like, all right, strip naked, we gotta see what this looks like, right? It's totally within reason. Keep their modesty, get them into the back of the ambulance, um, and just make sure we're, you know, patient privacy. Um, so, within reason. So, uh, yeah. 
as far as like we'll go in, we'll go into like hip injuries and foot later, but um, chest injury patients may be taking short, shallow breaths due to the injury or pain caused by the injury. So we need to make sure we pay close attention to their ABC. So if you can't take those full breaths because say you have a rib injury, things like that, uh, that tidal volume is going to be less. So they're going to have less of a reserve volume. Okay, so they're much more susceptible to not being able to breathe appropriately and start to desat, things like that. So we need to be on top of re-listening to lung sounds, reassessing our ABCs, high flow oxygen, just be a little bit more aggressive if they're taking those really short, shallow breaths um, and be aware that they may be more prone to decompensate if they're not breathing appropriately. The big thing we worry about with chest injuries, the main injury we're really concerned with is a pneumothorax. So a pneumothorax is an accumulation of air in the pleural cavity. So it's not necessarily always going to be like a hole in the lung itself. It's more of accumulation in this pleural sac here. So between the lung and the lining of the chest wall. So what it is is air accumulates here and collapses that lung because of the pressure it's exerting on the lung. Generally, it's caused by some sort of uh, penetrating injury. 85%, I think, plus of penetrating injuries cause a pneumothorax. So if you have a penetrating wound, gunshot victim, stab victim, uh, impalement of some sort, it's going to probably cause a pneumothorax. So just be aware of that. That's why a mechanism comes in play so often. But ribs themselves, in a, in a closed chest injury, ribs themselves can actually lacerate lung tissue can, and can cause a pneumothorax itself. So uh, it doesn't always have to be some penetrating external trauma. The ribs themselves can cause lacerations. They can cause pneumothorax. They can cause that collapsed lung, also known as atelectasis. So why is a pneumothorax so bad? One, obviously, with this lung's not working appropriately. Oh, sorry. I thought I was doing something wrong, but I forget. It's not live. Uh, it can also compress the heart. Exactly, right? <clears throat> so, not only is this lung not working, it's causing increased intrathoracic pressure. We talked a little bit about this last week, right? Intrathoracic pressure will cause decreased blood flow return to the heart itself for multiple reasons. So one, if there's increased pressure, it's going to potentially move that mediastinum over. So this is the mediastinum, the middle of the chest where the heart and great vessels sit. So when there's increased inner thoracic pressure, one, it's going to decrease blood flow to the heart because it's not that negative pressure moving everything in. But two, it's going to physically move that mediastinum over to the non-affected side. So if you can imagine, all these vessels are going to get slightly kinked a little bit, and we're going to have decreased blood flow return to the heart. When else do we have a switch from negative pressure to positive pressure? Ventilations. BVM. Using a BVM. It's not as impactful as a pneumothorax, but when we increase from uh, a patient's own ventilations to a BVM, positive pressure ventilations, it causes a bit of a decrease in that cardiac output because of that in decreased inner increased inner thoracic pressure, decreased uh, blood flow return back to the heart. So when we use a BVM, a lot of times what you end up seeing is their blood pressure will drop a little bit. Uh, their heart rate may increase a little bit because we're actually dropping their blood pressure by introducing positive pressure ventilations. So an open chest wound is commonly called a sucking chest wound. What do we do about that? Uh, a, seal. a seal? Yeah, throw a seal on it. How are we going to know where to throw a seal on it? If you walk up and they're bleeding from their chest, they're, it's a gunshot victim, stabbing victim, what do we, what's like the first thing we really need to do if they're still conscious? Control bleeding, expose them. This is a situation where you have, you have to find all the holes, right? Expose them, find the holes, control any bleeding, slap a, a chest seal on them. Anybody that has an open wound from their neck down to their hips, front and back, we're going to throw a seal on it, okay? A chest seal or an occlusive dressing. 
So neck, chest, belly, even not necessarily lower belly, but upper abdomen, and in the back, we're always going to throw a chest seal on it. Why do you think that is? Why would we throw a chest seal on the abdomen or the flank? Especially in a gunshot victim. Why do you think that is? What happens to a bullet once it en enters the body cavity? Bounce around, fragments. You never know what it's going to hit once it enters the body. So even if the entry wound is down low, uh, you don't know where that bullet has been inside their body. And what else do we need to look for when we see an entry wound? And where are we going to look for an exit wound? Anywhere. It can go anywhere. Like I said, once it enters that body cavity, in general, it's going to travel in a straight path until it hits something. But if it hits a bone, it can travel up and down the spine. We need to assess for the entry wound as well as the exit wound. So that way we can potentially throw a seal on it, control any bleeding that we can. Um, and so that's why it may seem silly again, but if you see like entry wound here, we need to expose them fully to look for an exit wound anywhere because it could go anywhere. Um, so just be aware if you see an entry wound, assess for an exit wound. Strip them and flip them, I think I talked about a few weeks ago. That's, that's where that really comes into play, uh, finding that entry and the exit wound. So signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax. What do you think you're going to see if this lung isn't working very well? Struggling to breathe, so difficulty breathing. One-sided chest rise. One-sided chest rise, what's the medical term for that? Unilateral. Unilateral chest rise. Okay, so paradoxical is where the chest is moving two different directions, whereas unilateral, only one side of the chest is moving at, this, at one time. What else? What about their SpO2? It's going to decrease, going to drop. What about their heart rate? Increase. Okay, what about their blood pressure? Increase. Why? Because their heart rate. Because their heart's pumping faster. So your heart rate pumps faster, so your blood pressure increases? I think it's your heart rate Because the cardiac output's not going to be as strong. Yeah, your cardiac output's decreased, your heart rate's increasing, so your blood pressure's going to drop. What kind of shock are they in? So uh, that's what stage of shock. So what type of shock are they in? Obstructive, good. It's physically obstructing the blood flow from the heart. The heart's pumping just fine, but there's an obstruction that's stopping the heart from pumping appropriately, or uh, the blood flow return to and from the heart. What about lung sounds? What are you going to hear on this side? Agonal lung sounds, is that a thing? I heard someone say it. Decreased? Decreased or absent. Decreased or absent lung sounds. Good. If that lung is collapsed and it's just air here, this air isn't necessarily moving with every breath, right? It's just going into that chest cavity. We're not going to hear lung sounds because we only hear lung sounds by air moving in and out of that alveoli. So if the alveoli are totally collapsed, we're not going to hear lung sounds. So we're going to have absent or decreased lung sounds, which... I can tell you now, those are the most difficult lung sounds to pick up on, are diminished lung sounds. Because they're, they're going to be normal. It's not like there's wheezes or rails or something to really pick up on. It's just more quiet than normal. So that's why it's so important that we're listening to lung sounds when you come to class. You're listening to lung sounds on every patient when you're out on the field. Because it's the things like this that you need to pick up on, that you need to know what normal is like to recognize what is abnormal. Um, I think there's a slide next. This next slide, hold on. Oops. Okay, yeah. No, I don't have a sign in. Find a good one that I've used in the past.
So this is a paradoxical movement. This is a good example of a closed chest injury where they have a flail chest and paradoxical movement. Some of these videos are pretty grainy overall. If you see this, you can almost assume they have some sort of pneumothorax. These are going to be more of the closed chest injuries a lot of times. So it's got an injury right here, obviously. And as you can see, this one's a little bit more subtle, but this side of the chest is going in, this side is going out, kind of opposite of what it should be doing. And that's called this is called a flail chest. We'll have a slide about it here in just a minute. So right here, when the chest is supposed to be expanding, basically it goes, the ribs come in. Not good. These are all closed chest injuries, a little bit more difficult to pick up on. Another one, what, this is like, you see, this is a very obvious one. So you can see right here, what do you think caused that? This is going to be a broken rib, a bunch of broken ribs. What do you think, what injury pattern do you think caused that if it's kind of going across his chest, seat belt? With a flail chest, um, is, it just the, is it just the diaphragm doing the chest contracting or is it still the uh, intercostal muscles? It's still going to be everything. Like everything's trying to work appropriately. It's just not stable anymore because the ribs are actually broken. So I have a picture coming up here in just a second that'll show. Uh, but going back a little bit, we'll have to go back to fill the chest in just a second, but going back to pneumothorax, in general, they all start as a simple pneumothorax. So this is just a buildup of air in the pleural space, but not enough to cause cardiac complications, okay? This is just a simple buildup of air in the chest cavity where it shouldn't be, uh, but not enough where it's causing that mediastinal shift, not causing those heart rate changes, blood pressure changes. This is kind of the lead up to what we call a tension pneumothorax. A simple pneumothorax is something we need to recognize. They'll still have pain over the area, probably still gonna have a little bit of a lower SpO2, maybe some difficulty breathing, but in general, they're not gonna have the decreased cardiac output quite yet, okay? And then, poor, tall, skinny young men here. Uh, Unfortunately, tall, skinny young men are very susceptible to spontaneous pneumothorax. So uh, this is just, they don't really know what causes it. It's just like a weakness in the chest wall. Uh, and essentially what happens is just one day you're walking down the street and then you're, you get a pneumothorax and they don't know why. So next time you have that little rib cramp, that's it. It's done. You're having a pneumothorax. So uh, I'm sorry, but yeah, next time you're out running. Uh, yeah, so a spontaneous pneumothorax can progress into a tension, but in general it's not considered life-threatening, usually a very minor injury, uh, but it is something that can occur. So simple pneumothoraxes are caused by blunt force trauma the vast majority of the time, uh, especially in the case of broken ribs. I have seen them be caused by things like pneumonia and infections because it causes uh, that lubricant that's on your pleural cavity between your, li your ribs and that pleural space. An infection will cause that to be inflamed and it can actually cause a pneumothorax for a medical reason. So uh, people with pneumonia are actually susceptible to simple pneumothoraxes as well. Uh, just to be aware of that. It's not always gonna be a trauma situation even though the vast majority of times it is. So. As EMTs, we need to be able to recognize a pneumothorax. What do we do about a simple closed pneumothorax? There's no chest seals to throw on, nothing. Supplemental oxygen. Supplemental oxygen, get them to the hospital. They need surgery, okay? There's not a whole lot we're gonna do. Even as a paramedic, for a simple pneumothorax, I'm probably not gonna do anything quite yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait until they get worse, right? Uh, so this is just more of a matter of recognizing the situation. Now, the big thing that we're worried about in a pneumothorax is a tension pneumothorax. 
So in a tension pneumothorax, the pressure in the chest has caused the mediastinum to shift to the unaffected side. So this is the patient's right over here, patient's left. We have the collapsed lung right here. So in general, it should take up this whole space, but it's collapsed all the way to this size. There's so much pressure on this side of the chest that it's shifted that mediastinum over, okay? Now look what else is shifting. What is this right here? What's that big open, yeah, that's your trachea. <laughs> okay, so this is your trachea or your windpipe. Look how it's shifting over, okay? That's called tracheal deviation, okay? So tracheal deviation is a late sign of a tension pneumothorax. So absent lung sounds on the affected side or diminished, depending on how bad it is, tachycardia, low blood pressure, low SpO2, tracheal deviation, and as well as JVD. Who can tell me what JVD is? Uh, jugular, jugular venous distension. It's pretty obvious once you see it for the first time, but that's JVD. Could pop an IV in that from across the room like a lawn dart. Just, yeah, JVD, it's distended jugular veins. This guy, it's incredible. So if you see that, you got to start asking yourself why. Okay, what are some other causes of JVD? Uh, cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade. Okay, tension pneumothorax. What's another one? We haven't really talked about it a whole lot, but if you've really read the book, you might know. Think of like backup of blood due to a medical reason. Oh, uh, congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure, yeah. Congestive heart failure can cause JVD. Not generally to this level. This guy is probably not doing well. Uh, but in general, it's going to look more like this. Just more of a swollen jugular vein. So, hemothorax. What's the difference between a pneumothorax and a hemothorax? Is hemothorax like blood in the cavity? Exactly. So this is the same concept of a pneumo, but it's caused by accumulation of blood in the thorax. So under every one of our ribs, there's a vein, an artery, and a nerve. Okay? And so when we get broken ribs or some sort of penetrating injury, we're bleeding from probably one of those veins, arteries, or nerves. It's not always going to be the great vessels of the heart, the, you know, the vena cava or anything like that, or the aorta. It could be the veins, arteries, veins or arteries that are underlying the, each rib. So we'll bleed heavily from those. They'll bleed into the chest cavity. Even broken ribs can cause this. That's why those can potentially be uh, a serious situation. It can cause hypovolemic shock as well as obstructive shock. What is hypovolemic shock? Someone just explain that one to me a little bit. Lacey? It's like loss of fluids. Loss of fluids, right? Like hemorrhaging, right? Yeah, loss of fluid, low volume essentially is what it means. Uh, so they will have hypovolemic shock as well as obstructive shock. They're going to have two types of shock at one time. What do you think their lungs are going to sound like? So imagine this, but instead of air, this is fluid. What do you think it's going to sound like? It's kind of a trick question. So once again, we're not moving air through this pleural cavity, right? You're only going to hear lung sounds if it's moving through the lungs. So once again, you're going to have absent or diminished lung sounds. So you're not going to be able to necessarily tell a hemothorax from a pneumothorax in the field, we can just kind of assume, they essentially mean the same thing to us, uh, that we're going to have to potentially get ALS involved, needle decompression, get into the hospital. Um, we are not going to be able to necessarily tell if it's a hemothorax or a pneumothorax, but on that note, a patient can have both, okay? So they can have a hemothorax, they can have a pneumothorax, where they can have a hemo which is an accumulation of air and blood in the chest cavity. So that'd be, that's a real bad day. Uh, and they can have a double hemo double pneumothorax, double hemothorax, just depending on how bad the situation is. 
Um, so it's not always going to be one lung. What happens to the trachea and all that stuff when it's both lungs affected? It's, it's probably just going to go to the more affected side first and then just kind of end up in the center. But um, that would be an interesting situation where you're, you're probably not going to be able to ventilate that person. You're probably not going to do a whole lot at all. Uh, in all reality, they're going to be a uh, traumatic cardiac arrest before we probably even get there. Is uh, hemo-pneumo, is that both of them combined? Is that exactly, yeah. So it's a, it's a hemothorax and a pneumothorax combined. So hemo-pneumo, they combined both of these. So hemo-pneumothorax. So treating an open chest wound, the definitive treatment for a pneumothorax is a chest tube or a collapsed lung in general. A lot of times they'll end up, it's a chest tube is what that you will get in the ER. Uh, flight paramedics can do chest tubes, but other than that, only in the ER are they going to get a chest tube. So uh, we're not going to do that in the field. We just need to recognize an open chest wound, treat it right away with chest seal, chest seal and oxygen, and then rapid transport to the hospital. It's, it's a matter of recognition in the field, getting ALS involved so that uh, the paramedics can do uh, a needle decompression. And then in the ER, they're going to get a chest tube in the, it's the fifth, between the fifth and the sixth rib in the mid-axillary space. So it's going to be like right here. I actually have one from when I was a baby, so it's pretty easy for me to point out. But it's going to be like right here. Uh, and they will they potentially do that on both sides if they have to, but you can see they have uh, blood or whatever the case may be inside that lung is going to come out, and it can be a lot of blood sometimes. Uh, have you ever seen them crack a chest open in the ER? Okay, it's an interesting process. Uh, that's the next step they would do if the chest tube wasn't working. So just know they're going to get a chest tube, but we can't do those in the field, so be aware of that. I showed you the video of the needle decompression a couple weeks ago, right? Or last week? Okay. Uh, also, along the lines of chest injuries, we're going to have a cardiac tamponade. We talked about that last week. What's the triad? Uh, jugular vein distension, uh, narrowing pulse pressure, and uh, tachycardia. Okay. What's the name of it? Bex triad. Bex triad. So Bex triad. Uh, it means cardiac tamponade. You can also look for muffled heart tones. So the pericardium, which is this little blue lining right here in a normal heart, will fill up with blood if the heart gets struck hard enough or there's some sort of penetrating injury or sometimes an infection. So pneumonia can also cause a cardiac tamponade. Essentially what that does is that fills up with blood and squeezes the heart, but not in the way it wants to be squeezed. So it's not going to pump as efficiently. So this decreases the amount of space the heart has to fill and contract. That's why it, that pulse pressure narrows. It never gets fully, it never pumps fully and it never gets fully emptied. So the pulse pressure is going to narrow. And this will lead to decreased cardiac output. And so the Bex triad, Guarantee you that'll be at least one test question. It'll be on the NREMT. The NREMT loves the Bex triad. I don't know why, but they do. Uh, but that means cardiac tamponade. Could you tell me what the Bex triad is one more time? Yeah, tachycardia, muffled heart tones, and JVD. Tachycardia or low blood pressure, sometimes they're interchangeable with that Bex triad. Uh, muffled heart tones and JVD. Why JVD? Somebody? Angelica? Um, isn't it because there's pressure where the heart is? So exactly. Like yeah, so there's pressure in that heart, so it's going to back up somewhere right up into the jugular veins. Good. Is it because, is it the left, is it the left atrium that isn't functioning, or is it left ventricle? It's the whole heart. So if you look at it like this, oh. the entire heart's being compressed. It's not necessarily heart failure. It's just a physical obstruction of the heart, so it's compressing the entire heart. Blood isn't able to go back into the heart and circulate through the body, so right. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. 
This will be a test question. Who just left, Marcus? Okay. Uh, flail chest. This is a definition that you'll see. A flail chest is three or more consecutive ribs that are broken in more than one spot. Remember that definition. This causes a floating section of chest wall. I've only seen a couple, probably three of these, four of these maybe. They're really interesting to see. And this leads to paradoxical movement of the chest. Remember where unilateral is one side of the chest rising while the other side is not moving. Paradoxical is opposite movement of the chest. So one side of that chest is moving in, one side is moving out, opposite of each other. And the treatment is positive pressure ventilation, so BVM use. Marcus, this is a test question, just so you know. So three or more ribs, consecutive ribs, not just three random ribs, three or more consecutive ribs broken in two or more, or sorry, more than one spot, so two or more places. And I'll show you a picture here. Oh, well, here's another video. I think that was the one we already saw. So. This part of the chest is moving in. This one's moving as it normally really should. So it's in your book as well, but a flail segment is three or more ribs. So one, two, three, broken in two or more places. So this section of the chest is essentially just floating there. What do you think could also happen with the flail segment when you have these shards of bone sitting in your chest? Puncture a lung, hemonumo, you have those veins, arteries, and nerves that run under every rib. So when that's exposed, it's going to lacerate those veins and those arteries. So hemothorax, pneumothorax, things like that, as well as just respiratory insufficiency because you don't have that structure overall to take that deep breath when you have three or more broken ribs in uh, with a flail chest like that. The book says two or more. The book says two or more. I promise you on the test it's going to be three or more of the National Registry definition. And if that is ends up being wrong, then I'll give you that point back. But it's always been three or more on the tests. Uh, not like it. So CPR is going to cause. CPR will cause basically a separation of the sternum from all of this cartilage right here. So you're not technically breaking ribs necessarily, but it's very easy to break ribs, say, out here. So I guess you could, uh, but in general, it's probably just going to crack the ribs out here and not going to break them in two or more spots. But yeah, you'll definitely separate this cartilage, and it is, whew, I'll never forget the first time I did CPR. It was disgusting. Um, yeah. Or What's that? Is it called the costal or intercostal? Which part? So you have your intercostal muscles. The cartilage. The, oh. Uh, I think it's called the costal cartilage because it's not in between your ribs. Does the cartilage heal back after you're done? It'll heal back eventually, yeah. Costal cartilage, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and just for you, so you guys know, these presentations, while they're not on Canvas, these are made from the book presentations. So we just kind of pared it down. So all the information is in Canvas with these presentations. We've just pared it down to what we think is important, essentially. So. What's cracking the chest? If you're squeamish, don't look. Uh, someone got way too excited. 
I don't actually know. I don't, it's really hard to find good medical videos. So generally, if I find one, I save them somewhere. But we're obviously not going to watch. Well, essentially what they do is they open up the chest and they'll stop bleeding directly. They'll find the source of whatever's bleeding and then uh, stop it directly with clamps and cauterization and such. So it's surgery in the ER, basically. It's like the first step. It's a really dirty version of surgery, but yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways. So yeah, that's kind of how what it is. Not super important that we need to know it, but just that's something that will happen. You might hear that term a lot. Traumatic asphyxia. This is a sudden compression of the chest Restricting, restricting expansion of the chest and leading to asphyxia. So think of like a blunt force injury, compression of that entire chest. So steering wheel into the chest, things like that, but to a point not just where it stops, but it's like it's such a force that it's a very sudden compression of the entire chest. Um, Think of like semi into a car, right? Like not just the steering wheel itself, but it's the force of everything going directly into that chest or something falling onto a patient. Uh, it can lead to blunt force injuries of the heart and lungs. So what we're going to look for is JVD, cyanosis to the face. And then the key note comparing this to a lot of things is hemorrhage of the sclera of the eye, the petechiae. Generally, this is a very high level of fatality. Like, in almost every time, they're not going to be alive. At least they're not going to be conscious. This is a very uh, fatal injury to have. Because essentially, it compress your entire chest. So your chest it, it didn't work, right? So it's going to cause all that pressure to go up to your head. That's why you get that hemorrhage of the sclera. I've that, seen that. You've seen that? Mm -hmm. It's not pretty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, choking victims will get uh, petechiae hemorrhage of the sclera. Same kind of reasoning, this that increased pressure to the eye. So you'll see that with choking victims as well, or strangulation victims. Not choking, strangulation. That is an actual legal term I found out last year. Uh, they call it strangulation in court, not choking, because choking is like choking on food. And then every, everybody's famous, or famous, favorite one is Commodio Cordis. I had a student a couple years ago that every time we were like reviewing for a test after this, I was like, all right, causes a chest pain, causes a shortness of breath. He was like, Commodio Cordis, every time, it's without fail. Commodio Cordis is a blunt force chest injury at a certain point in the cardiac cycle that will put a patient into a cardiac dysrhythmia. Typically, the patient goes into V-fib, which... Are AEDs recognized and causing a sudden cardiac arrest and it's been found to respond very well to defibrillation so these are the types of patients that yes they went into cardiac arrest but they're easy to get back the classic example of commodio cordis is like the little leaguer that takes a line drive to the chest goes into cardiac arrest usually a healthy person it just happens to be at the wrong time uh, take a direct shot to the chest right during a specific part of the cardiac cycle, and then it sends them into cardiac arrest. What part of the cardiac cycle? It's called a Q on T phenomenon. So it's like right in between two heartbeats, essentially. There's a, it's called the absolute refractory period of the T cycle, where if it, something happens right then, it can send them into cardiac arrest. Not a, that won't be on your test. Don't worry about that. But that's just what it is. This is what V-fib looks like on the monitor. No organization at all, right? There's nothing. This is just random squiggle lines, the bad lines. Q 
Okay, so does anybody have questions on chest injuries? It's open or closed, put seals on it if you're worried about it, high flow oxygen, BVM if needed, get ALS en route if they need to decompress the chest, and get them to the hospital, right?